It does not happen very often that I write a book review, but uh, Wolfgang Strick's book titled Buying Time, The Delayed Crisis of Democratic Capitalism, uh, describes the capitalist crisis from a European perspective. And it is written so well and so amazing and so thorough in its analytical approach that I am very much inclined to bring it closer to the reader. Streck's goal is to explain the interconnected financial and economic crisis that uh, comes at the heels of the decades-long neoliberal policies which transformed the Keynesian economic institutional system of post-war capitalism into a new Hayekian economic regime. Strick points out that the state plays an important role in the handling of the crisis and that contrary to the claims of the varieties of capitalism literature which argues that capitalist countries pursue uh, different economic policies, there is in fact a common trend among all uh, Western developed nations. So what does the economic crisis consist of? It consists of four interrelated crises. First is the banking crisis. Banks across the world benefited from deregulation by extending credit to ever more people, leading to default and banks that no longer could um, extending any more credits to each other, uh, which leads to a crisis, a crisis of confidence, which the government and central bank addresses with massive bailouts. That leads to the second factor, which is the state fiscal crisis. Uh, bank bailouts, current fiscal commitments and social spending and infrastructure spending, uh, recession-induced unemployment spending, lower tax revenues and tax cuts uh, for the wealthy uh, predict predictably lead to more government borrowing. Growing state debt leads to panic in the financial markets which induces government officials to pass austerity measures uh, targeted as social programs that precipitate a real economic crisis. And that leads to the third factor which is the real economic crisis. The banking and liquidity crisis, government austerity, and lower business and consumer confidence lead to economic stagnation and high unemployment. Even with all the liquidity that is provided by the central banks, there is a lack of borrowing in the real economy that prolongs the crisis. Fourth um, is the legitimation crisis, according to Strick. Capitalists only want to make investments if they are uh, assured uh, a certain um, economic return that they desire. During certain periods, they don't want to make investments, which we might call an investment strike, resulting in unemployment and economic crisis. But business confidence is not merely a function of economics, i.e. the money return that they get but of class politics, that is to say, the competition uh, between the businessmen uh, on the one hand with the government and workers for uh, status, power and resources. During the heyday of post-war Keynesianism in the 1960s, the workers went on several strike waves which really concerned capitalists. Kaletsky, an economist had argued that capitalists are unwilling to invest if the unemployment rate becomes too low because then workers become too demanding and bid up wages and so capitalists go on an investment strike even if they remain profitable after the wage increases. Given these interlinked and interdependent crises, what can the state do? Strick's basic argument is that all the government has been able to do to prevent full-scale economic collapse is to implement policies that are temporarily useful but are not useful over the long term uh, due to high political and economic costs. Governments in all developed countries are in effect buying time, which is the title of the book. Uh, 
and they're buying time in order to delay a big economic crisis but they're really in no position to prevent it here are the tools that the government has at the disposal number one inflation this was the preferred policy tool of the government of the 1970s by injecting more cash into the economy and creating what Keynes had called a money illusion the government was hoping to re-establish re a social consensus by satisfying business as well as worker interests as companies hiked prices unionized workers went on strike and demanded higher wages this development led predictably to a wage price spiral and economic stagnation. The simple trade-off between inflation and unemployment, which economists call the Phillips curve, was replaced by both increasing inflation and unemployment. Central banks became worried by this development, and the U.S. Federal Reserve, under the leadership of Paul Volcker, uh, committed to a policy to very deflationary policies uh, during the high interest regime beginning in the late, late 1970s in the 1980s the political rise of Thatcher and Reagan led to the assault on labor unions the industrialization the weakening of workers collective bargaining power and thus leading to the end of rising wages Inflation control was established by a restrictive monetary policies of the Federal Reserve as much as by a smashing of organized labor. In any case, inflation uh, was no longer the preferred policy tool to address economic crisis, which benefits creditors. The second strategy was um, the rise in the, in the state debt, which leads to um, the fiscal crisis. And this is one of the central pillars of uh, Strake's argument. Governments wanted to pay for social programs and uh, different types of investments, again, to calm social conflicts. But they did not want to tax people since that creates a current social conflict, which they wanted to avoid at all costs. So they borrowed money from capital markets to do that. Thankfully, governments deliberately liberalized capital markets right around the 1970s allowing governments to tap into capital of investors from other countries the government's borrowing en masse went well for a little more than a decade but by the early 1990s the western governments made an about face as you know the they raised the ire of investors uh, and uh, the bond markets Sweden, for example, entered a major financial crisis after having deregulated the banks and allowing them to go bust on the bubble. And thereafter, they began fiscal consolidation or austerity. My, even my native Austria abandoned Keynesian-style state spending, and since joining the European Union in 1995, um, they had signed on to the deficit-limiting Maastricht criteria, part of the EU treaty. And they have entered a path of fiscal consolidation, budget cutting, and the privatization of state firms. The United States put Bill Clinton in charge, who enforced um, a policy of deficit reduction and budget cuts, and created a massive federal budget surplus by the end of the 1990s. But that led to the third factor, which is the rise in private debt. State fiscal consolidation in the 1990s would have been economically disruptive because the government was cutting spending in the important parts of the economy. So the government deregulated uh, private capital markets once more, which led to a borrowing spree of consumers and private sector households. In the US, the rise of the government primary surplus went hand in hand with an increase in private household indebtedness. In fact, that was the whole secret behind the booming 1990s, beside the tech bubble. The same policy was in place in Britain and in Scandinavia. In the US, there was a mild recession in 2001, but thankfully the Federal Reserve lowered interest rates 
Bush fought two wars without paying for it from taxes, of course they borrowed money, and the deregulated banking industry handed out ever more subprime mortgages to unqualified low-income home buyers. This house of cards came crashing down in 2008, after which most Western countries went back to a rise in the public debt uh, as the private sector is beginning to deleverage. The rising government debt is associated with the bank bailout and austerity measures. The rise in debt is associated with the increase in control and power of the financiers. And the fourth strategy, finally, uh, are central bank purchases of public debt and bank liabilities. This point has really not been talked about by Strick uh, because, all that much because it is relatively new and has only been pursued uh, since 2008. The balance sheet of the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank have expanded enormously in order to calm the markets. Financial news media reports in the last few years have been more focused on the central bank than ever. As a debate of tapering produced shivers among some investors who thought that the Fed adding cash to the party was essential to keep the stock and bond market um, alive. A congressional report resulting from a Fed audit shows that the Fed had handed out $16 trillion in revolving loans to big financial institutions and foreign central banks in order to avoid a complete financial meltdown. The ECB played a huge role in calming the bond market as they added over a trillion euros in low interest loans to um, private financial institutions and banks who then were required to lend it at slightly higher interest rates uh, to the crisis ridden economies in southern Europe. Um, who had really high uh, bond interest rates um, due to uh, investor lack of investor confidence. But calming the markets is only half of the story. The other is to get the economy started again, which a few years on has certainly not happened in Europe and only haphazardly here in the U.S. Streck indicates the possibility of exhaustion of the central bank strategy in the near future. Marx's proverbial saying of capitalism buying another lease of life has never been truer than today. The role of the state has been moving in different stages, which uh, Strick also explored. It began with a tax state, uh, namely by the early 20th century, uh, the government began to play a greater role in society which may be considered the externality of growing a uh, private market system because you have to pro provide for a welfare state, you have to provide for infrastructure um, and legal framework. And that has to be financed all by taxation. Um, and uh, the second stage um, is the debt state, which I just explored. Um, as you know, the government um, doesn't tax its citizens enough it uh, moves from a tax state to a debt state. And in the th uh, third stage, um, because the debts are becoming too high, um, the government is moving to become a consolidation state, which means committing to policies of austerity on the people, which I will explore in the next segment of the video.